And then I've also written that first publication about Rousseau in 2000, where I actually wrote about Rousseau's concept of democracy. Rousseau said the origin of inequality between people is private property. And there it all began. It starts with somebody building a fence around his land and saying, this belongs to me. The bad thing, Rousseau said, isn't that he did this, but that the others believed him. Today, the same can be said about genetic engineering. We've got a sort of new feudalism. Nature's resources are being privatized, and the others, who also own these natural resources, pay only to be able to use parts of these resources. And a part of that is knowledge of what's been produced before and getting newly patented. Even nature is getting patented. So in these neo-feudalist times we live in, it is so obvious to me that we're going back to times when a king said, this river is mine, or this land is mine, and farmers have to pay in order to use it. Back then they had religion to authorize and justify that. Strangely enough, today it's the scientists. Heute merkwürdigerweise machen die Wissenschaftler das. important to recognize that the air is the thing that binds us all together and where a lot of the information of biology even though it's produced by organisms that are grounded like plants they always are putting out their signals their messages into the air so if you sample air you should be able to read the world of DNA even for large organisms our own bodies we are surrounded. Right now I'm surrounded by a cloud of my own cells that are continuously coming off from my surface. And I should be able to pick those up from the air and detect that I am here or that you are here or that you were here. And the aim of that research is to give people the capacity to see the DNA in the world around them that they cannot see. And this includes, very importantly, transgenic DNA. 1.3 miles per hour, 1 1.5, 1.6. I'm just someone who became really, I could say, fall in love with fungi. Whenever I, when the first time I heard about fungi, I just thought, what an amazing thing. This thing that is visible, you know, the mushroom is visible, and yet, I, as, a, as a child, I would just go and dig, try and find the root of this thing, and of course you don't find anything, because it becomes a microbe. So this really is a, an incredible window into the world of the invisible. Um, insects are also like that. You know, you see them and then you don't see them because they're too small. And what happened there, I don't know, until you start finding out. And um, so that's really what drives me, I think, and has driven my whole career. So I did my PhD in Wales, studying fungi. Then I came to upstate New York study fungi, always looking for the invisible part of it. So I was about to go to the tropics. I was going to go to Panama when I got a phone call from Switzerland saying, we've been watching what you're doing and we find it very interesting and we wonder if you would like to come and do it here. And uh, what do you say to that? I said, well, I don't know who you are. I don't know. It turns out it was Novartis and it was the research part of Novartis, and they wanted, to, they wanted me to go. It 
made me nervous to know it was a transnational company. At that time, it was the second largest pharmaceutical and agrochemical company. And of course, I knew about corporations, and I was worried about it. But I thought, you know, that's where fungi are taking me. And that's where I'm going to be able to study this fungi. That's where I'll go. And that, by that time, looking at the industry from inside really changed me. I was really carrying these two sources of interest. On the one hand, the interest for the microbial, for the invisible. On the other hand, the interest for the uh, institutions that do scientific research. And ever since my career has been dedicated to put these two things together, I really think that everything I do in science has to have consequence for politics, and that politics are influencing dramatically what I am doing as well as other people are doing in science. Yeah, this little house came to us as a, it's, it feels as something of fate. Um, and it's in a very special place. Uh, below us, we can see the hall of the public campus of Berkeley, the University of California, Berkeley. And we're standing at a boundary where that campus meets the private and military part of the research machine. This is a big research machine. One side of it has public, the other side is private, corporate, and military. It is a canyon that carries water, but it also carries ideas for the world. And out of this canyon, a lot of imagination has come out for the world, for better and for worse. And uh, one of the very important things that has come out of this canyon, and especially from the military part of it, is the Manhattan Project, the generation of the whole field of nuclear physics and the application of the, that nuclear physics to the uh, production of vastly destructive forces. And all the wars that have been happening get projected from here out. So this campus, this location where we are right now, was from the beginning thought to be the projection of America into the world, towards the West, where the new world was going to open for new commercialization and new trade. And we just happened to be here. The generation of knowledge that comes out of this place is very important for the world, not only because of technology, but also because of how we understand ourselves in our role in the world, in our role with nature. So that enclosing of the knowledge that used to be public and becomes private or becomes corporate or becomes militarized secret, that enclosure of knowledge is something that I consider to be very damaging for the movement of science and the movement of knowledge. So it is a very strong battle that is happening here and in other places in the world to try and protect that diversity of knowledge, that diversity of culture. The latest development in this battle has been the arrival here on this campus of uh, BP, British Petroleum, who would like to be called Beyond Petroleum. BP came here offering $500 million, $500 million, which is much more than anybody had ever offered the university, supposedly for research. Um, administrators for the university find it very difficult to say no to money and it doesn't matter where the money comes from, they want the money. So they try to pass this contract with BP without people noticing. But we have been able to find out a few things about it. We know that BP wants new buildings in the canyon. They want buildings that are built behind the fences of the national lab so that nobody can access them. They want access to our students. They want access to our seminars so that they can find out which ideas are useful for them. They want to have control over publication, what gets published, what gets said publicly or not. But more importantly, they also want access to the curriculum, to 
what will be taught in the university. And because this is a, this is a public university, we also determine the curriculum of the children from kindergarten all the way to high school. And BP now has access to deciding what is called science and what is not called science. So now they can say whoever is on our side is a scientist and whoever is not on our side is not a scientist. So the power that they gain from that is, is extraordinary. And um, they close the door shut to any public view of what's happening behind the walls, behind the fences and the screens of academic research. Yeah, this is the latest place where resistance has been expressed in a real way. Um, it's just very upsetting to see, I'm sorry. I hadn't been since they, since they took the three-seaters out. I, I just couldn't face coming here and seeing. Um, this area was covered in oaks old oaks. Uh, when the university decided to cut these trees down to build more buildings in, uh, in association with BP, uh, students went up on the trees and they stayed there for two years. This used to be three layers of fencing when the, when the students were up on the trees as if they were extremely dangerous animals. We house hyenas that are very dangerous up in the canyon. There's a special ca cage with hyenas they have only two fences. And to cage students protesting, we had to put three with barbed wire on top, making sure that nobody would go in. There were four people left at the end. There were very heavy lights to prevent them from sleeping. Uh, nobody could pass food or water to them. It was really a situation that reminded everybody of the situation in Guantanamo, as if they were prisoners of some, some kind. And they were trying to starve them, starve them out. And as soon as they were down, as if there was this anger for this resistance, the trees were immediately cut down on the same day and turned into these mountains of chips. So this is what's left of an old grove of beautiful oak trees. Unfortunately, we are in a minority, people who oppose it. And I have been very involved in trying to oppose this as well as other advances of this corporatized kind of science, this privatized kind of science, because I believe that the main problem is that people don't realize what's happening. And by the time they will wake up, it will be too late. The possibility of having a public university doing public research and developing public understanding of humanity is going to be gone.